That is a picture of me when I was about 18, growing up in the bush of Rhodesia in Africa. Thank you. And uh, very eager to join the game department and save the wonderful big game of Africa. But my life turned out very differently, as you saw from the pictures. I became a politician, a soldier, a farmer, a consultant. But everything was the same problem. Poor land, poor people, social upheaval, war, and the problems that we have. Now, we are facing, if I can have the first picture. Here we go. We're facing a, a global tsunami coming on us, and I'm not going to belabor it. Johan uh, put it all very well for you. It's of our own making, global climate change, expanding population, and global desertification that very few of us talk about. Uh, when we look at the fossil fuel part of the problem, it's no, there's no question to it. We'll only solve it with technology. No, nothing else is going to solve that. I want to talk to you about the desertification part of the problem specifically today when we bare land and the rainfall becomes less effective. Now, we've got parts of the world where the environment is humid throughout the year. You live in one of them here in this part of the world. And although things can go very wrong, they do not turn into deserts. Nature is very forgiving and covers up bare soil very quickly. And we have environments where a part of the year is wet and then it becomes very, very dry indeed. And these are where the problem is occurring mainly. Now, fortunately from NASA, we can see the proportions fairly readily. What you see in brown and um, circled in red is what is desertifying and generally the dark green across the tropics isn't and the light green in the high latitudes isn't. So it's most of the world's land that I'm talking to you about and no, no land, no country can be an island unto itself these days. <coughs> I took this picture in the Tehama Desert many years ago when 25 millimeters of rain was falling. Think of it in terms of drums, each containing 200 liters, and what we had was over 1,000 drums of water on every hectare of land. That's a lot of land, uh, water that day that fell on that land. That is a picture of the land the next day. Where had that water gone? It was non-effective because it went back to the atmosphere evaporating from the soil or ran off. If, as you probably know, the fate of carbon and water follow one another, being linked to organic matter in the soil, so most of the carbon also goes to the atmosphere. Now, what we need over most of the world is effective rainfall where the bulk of the rain that falls leaves the soil only through green plants growing or goes down into underground water sources keeping springs and rivers flowing. We're told in the mainstream thinking that desertification is a problem for arid and semi-arid regions of the world and that grasslands like this are not desertifying. That's because we look at grasslands. But if we look into grasslands and down into the, to, towards the soil, we find that that grassland in high rainfall has hard-capped bare soil between the plants and most of the water is running off or evaporating out. That is the cancer of desertification that unfortunately do, we do not recognize till the terminal form of the disease. Now, we know and have known for centuries what is causing desertification. It's livestock. Overgrazing, too many animals, leaving the ground bare. Everybody knows that. It's taught in every university of the world. Everybody from Nobel laureates to golf caddies knows that. I was taught that at university. Now, I grew up in environments like this in Africa, hating livestock because of that, because I loved wildlife and I was seeing the habitat being destroyed, and that was the greatest danger to wildlife. Well, I've got news for you. We were once just as certain that the world was flat. Everybody knew it was. We were wrong then, and we're just as wrong now. So I want to invite you to come on my journey of learning and rediscovery after my university education. When I was a young man in the 50s in Africa, I was in the game department of colonial service, Northern Rhodesia at that time, and I was involved in setting aside 
some of the most marvelous areas in Africa as future national parks. We removed the drum beating, muzzle loading, uh, gun firing people to protect the animals and make them future national parks. No sooner did we do that than the land began to deteriorate, as you see in this picture, and desertify. Now, we had no livestock there. These were tsetse fly areas. And logically, I assumed it must be too many elephants now. So I did the research, and I proved there were too many elephants, and that we would have to cull them and bring their numbers down to a la level that the land could sustain if we were going to save them. Now, that was an extremely unpopular thing to say in those years. It was political dynamite. So our government formed a committee of scientists to validate my work. They went through it all with me on the land and the research and everything. They agreed with me. And in the following years, we went ahead and our government shot over 40,000 elephants to try to save the land in these areas. It got worse, not better. Now, I love elephants more than any animal, and that was just a tremendous jolt, the biggest blunder of my life. I will carry that to my grave. One good thing came out of it. It made me totally, absolutely determined to find solutions. No longer would I talk about problems. My life would be devoted to solutions. That's the one good thing that came out of it. Now, through political opposition, to the government at the time, the Smith government that we had, I was forced into exile, and I got to America. And I got a shock when I found national parks like this in America desertifying as badly as anything we had in Africa. But there'd been no livestock there for over 70 years, and I found American scientists had no explanation for it. It's arid, it's left to nature, that's natural. I then began to look at the research plots all over the Western United States that were put in to prove that land would recover if you removed the livestock, because the government planned to shoot 50,000 sheep. These were put in many years ago. They went ahead and shot the sheep. The land got worse. Thank God they left the research plots. So research plots like this one that had been green growing grass in 1961 had become desert like that by 2002. Now, the position paper on climate change that I obtained these pictures from, the researchers had no explanation for this except unknown processes. Don't know what they are. What we had missed was the fact that these seasonal rainfall environments of the world are the areas where the plants, the soil, and everything there developed with millions of herding animals, and that these herding animals developed with ferocious pack-hunting predators. And the only defense that the females have in these large herds is to get into bunches, get into large herds, because the predator fears the herd and has to isolate animals to kill them. Now, when animals that graze are in high bunching numbers, they dung and urinate all over their own food. And no animal, including humans, likes to feed close to their own feces. So they had to keep moving. And it was that movement that prevented the overgrazing of plants, while that trampling, dunging, and urinating left the ground covered with mulch, dung, and urine. And we had missed that point. Here is a typical grassland in seasonal rainfall on land that we manage in Africa. It has just come through four months of rain, and it looks beautiful. Now, watch the change as it goes into eight months of dry season with no rain. All of that grass above ground is dying, and that has to biologically decay before the next rains. Otherwise, sunlight cannot reach the growth points that are out of way of, harm, of harm's way with grazing animals. If we do not graze it and we remove the animals, it turns to a slow process of chemical breakdown and physical weathering, oxidation. And the land is left bare, giving off carbon and water 
and leading to desertification. We can burn it, which is what we have traditionally done. But if we burn it, it is rapid oxidation, and it pollutes the atmosphere and gives off carbon from the soil and water leaves the soil, and we have desertification. We have traditionally burnt it and justified the burning because it does clear the growth points and allow the new fresh green growth to come out. That is the basis on which we have justified it. But as you can see, it leaves the ground bare. And that is the big crime. So what are we to do in a grassland like that? We've got eight months to get rid of that grass, to keep that soil alive, and that grassland alive, and the world from desertifying. I'm talking about two-thirds of the world. Yeah. No technology even imaginable can restore biological decay on that scale over billions of hectares of the world every year. You can forget about any even imaginable technological solution to restore biological decay. If we let it, if we reduce the animals, it oxidizes. If we burn it, it's the same thing. We lead to desertification. So what are we going to do? Humans only have those three tools. The only other tool we've ever developed is small living organisms to make cheese and wine. There's no other tool available to humans. We have only got one option. There is no other option, and that is to do the unthinkable and to use livestock as a proxy for those former wild herds and pack hunting predators. Now, let's do that on a piece of the land and see what happens. We'll impact it very heavily with a herd of cattle, and almost immediately you see the improvement. The grass is now down on the ground. Any rain falling on that is going to be absorbed, held in the soil, and when the green flush is possible, it starts to happen without having used fire and exposed the soil. When we first realized, or I did, in the 1960s, that we had no option but livestock, I was faced with a terrible dilemma. How do you do it? We'd had over 10,000 years of extremely knowledgeable pastoralist cultures whose whole life is livestock. They had bunched and moved their animals for 10,000 years with more knowledge than we have today, and they'd caused the great man-made deserts. So clearly, we couldn't just bunch and move the animals. Then we'd had 100 years of modern range science, grazing systems, rotational grazing, and all these things, and that had accelerated desertification as we first discovered in Africa, and then I was able to confirm in the United States, and as you see, on this land, it's managed by the federal government of the United States. So what are you going to do? At that point, I realized that we ecologists had never dealt with anything as complex as this. And rather than reinvent the wheel, I started looking at all other businesses and so on to see if anybody had come close to this. I found there was one profession, the military. Over 300 years, they had had to develop techniques to deal with very complicated, ever-changing situations in immediate battlefield conditions. So I just took Sandhurst military planning, immediate battlefield conditions, and used that to plan the complexity that we needed. And that was so easy to do with simple steps that even a child can follow, and all we had to do was lay it out on a chart because we had to deal with years ahead, months ahead, etc., And that we call holistic planned grazing. The word holistic covers the decision-making part of it, where we had also to discover and develop a simple way to make every objective in management socially, environmentally, and economically sound short and long term. And then this planning technique. That worked immediately, and we've had it working and now it's extended to over uh, 40 million acres, 15 million hectares in the world. We are now training, or have a uh, young woman like this, training villagers to do it in Africa, how to bring their animals together, do the planning, and they're beginning to resuscitate the land, where we bring their crops into the planning, because corn is just a grass, and use the animals. We're seeing greatly increased yields and larger cob sizes on their crops, let me talk about a few of the results. 
This is a piece of bare ground you see here that I've known for many years. I used to own this ranch and then I donated it for the good of the people of Africa and we use it as a learning site. So I've known it many years. It has been bare and eroding regardless of rainfall for over 30 years and um, the whole area around like there is like this. Now this particular area has just come, it's in the community, it's just come through four months of very good rain that year. All that rain has gone back to the atmosphere or run off and coming onto our land nearby, uh, well sorry this is one more picture in the community, their river is already dry, we've got 150,000 people on almost permanent food aid now. Now coming back onto our land the same day, the river is flowing. Abundant production. Now we did that by increasing the livestock 400% using the holistic planned grazing. And before we began, that actual piece of land looked like this. So we know what is possible and have been doing this for years. Looking at some other results, this piece of land had been bare and eroding for over 30 years. I've had to mark the tree. We've done nothing here except use livestock, mimicking nature, and you watch the change after 30 years of being bare. Another site I've marked there, and there we had lost about 15 centimeters or more of soil, and you can see the change. That's the exact same site. This site I've had to mark the hill. This is in Mexico, and the change there is so profound that you won't recognize it if I hadn't marked the hill. This is a picture in the Karoo Desert of the southern part of Africa. I began fam helping a family here many years ago to convert that desert back to grassland, and thankfully their grandchildren are now on the land with a hope for the future. In this picture, you, the gully you see on the left has healed up entirely using nothing but livestock mimicking nature, and thank goodness once more we've got the third generation with hope for the future. This picture is in Patagonia, in Argentina, and the man in the middle is a government research officer, he was, and he's been recording the steady decline of that land over many years as they decreased and decreased animal numbers, and then they've got involved with holistic plan grazing, they put 25,000 sheep in one flock. And they got a 50%, sorry, they got a 50% measured improvement in the production of the land in the first year, doing the opposite of what we used to believe. We're training pastoralist communities in the violent horn of Africa, and they're openly saying this is the only hope they have of saving their families, saving their cultures. I remind you that I'm talking here about the most problematic region of the world, where we're going to fight water wars worse than oil wars and where about 95% of the land can only feed people from animals, much vilified livestock. Because most people can't grasp numbers quickly, this I think will help you. New Mexico, the state of New Mexico, is not quite the size of Sweden. It is desertifying very seriously indeed. Many years ago this dam was built, Elephant Butte Dam, at the time it was built, it was the largest dam in the United States. In that state, we have only got to make 25 millimeters of rain more effective, which is easy to do now, and makes money rather than costs money, and that equals more than 3,000 dams the size of Elephant Butte every single year. And remember that the fate of carbon and water tend to follow one another in the organic matter in the soil. What I'm telling you is mind-boggling in its significance. And that can only be done with livestock. No technology or anything else available to us. What we are doing today, globally, organizations, environmental, we're all involved in this with our beliefs. What we are doing is causing climate change as much as fossil fuels, frankly, and probably more. And what is most serious is even after we discover and alternatives to fossil fuels, do away with them entirely, climate change will continue unless we address this 
problem. And as I'm speaking to you, thousands and thousands of men, women, and children are suffering in the poverty, the violence, and the water wars that we are seeing. I believe I've shown you that by simply mimicking nature, understanding a new insight, and how blind we were to it because of our beliefs, that we have hope now, real hope, for your children, their children, and all of humanity. Thank you. Thank you.